Hello everyone. Welcome to NPTEL course on groundwater hydrology and management. This is week four, lecture five. We're coming to the close of discussing the hydrological components for groundwater analysis. Uh, we understood the major components in this lecture, this week's lecture, and we will look at some more important um, aspects of the component that we saw, especially hydraulic conductivity. So hydraulic conductivity has a lot of variations, which means a range was expressed uh, in the detailed data set that we shared from the book. Um, and most of these books have a similar range. And so if you check with other aspects, also the ranges would be similar. Most of these data are collected in the lab and measured. So more or less, we can use it across the world for any system. So uh, I, as I promised, we'll do some comparison for gravel um, of hydraulic conductivity at annual scales. So look, we have a gravel uh, at around 10 or minus one meters per second. Uh, and we also compare it with clay, which is very, very less, around 10 power minus 9 uh, centimeter per second. Okay. So we have uh, two values for uh, hydraulic conductivity, and we've taken uh, the mid average for gravel around 1 centimeter per second here, uh, and then 10 power minus 9 uh, centimeter per second. Let's see what that equates to if we convert it to uh, an hourly as i said you have to convert it to hourly then daily then annual so to convert that uh, you could do it on your calculator or you could just quickly run it through google so one centimeter per second to kilometer per year please look at how i've typed it centimeter slash second to kilometer slash year and once the automatically Google will give you the calculator and convert it. Okay. Um, so you have the one value I put is just one, but you can put 10, 5, depending on the value you have in your uh, measurements. Uh, so for now, let's take one. We've taken it from the table. So one centimeter per second equals to 350 kilometers per calendar year. So that's how much groundwater would travel from a particular location to another location. So HA to HB, the uh, two wells, uh, it would travel <coughs> um, around as, uh, estimating the velocity between the wells. We could estimate it to be around 315.36, uh, the hydraulic conductivity per year. Okay, so let's compare that to uh, clay. Okay, we had one centimeter second power 10 power minus 9 so that is uh, you have eight zeros and a one uh, two millimeters per year if you convert that that is not even in kilometers so we don't forget the kilometers we're not going to go to kilometers we're just going to millimeters so not even one millimeter per calendar year the water will move okay millimeter is very small but even that distance it doesn't move Okay, so that is how the difference is in nature. Uh, and so when you go to a soil and a location with clay uh, structures and, and st soil, please understand the water moves very, very slow. Okay, so if you are uh, depleting the aquifer, the recharge would happen very slow. Uh, and so you need to warn the farmers that you're not just going to get water every year the same rate, it will come low. Uh, whereas in a gravelly system, uh, it travels fast. So that is why the mountain water, you could reach in the springs and waterfall because water enters these gravel and then quickly comes to the springs and waterfalls. Um, just think about it, uh, 315 kilometers uh, per, per calendar year is the, is the hydraulic conductivity uh, as a rate. So uh, this, uh, if you uh, have a unit, for example, Q uh, is the velocity uh, is equals to K times del H by del L. Uh, and if del H, uh, dH by dL is a unit difference, uh, you have one, okay? So if you're taking a unit difference, 
uh, and uh, the distance between the uh, uh, locations was one. Okay, so that one will go off, and or uh, your Q is absolutely equal to your K. Uh, and that is how you could estimate the velocity uh, of a unit uh, in your soil. So that unit is very, very important and it gives you around 315 uh, kilometers per year. So that's how much fast the water can uh, flow through in a year uh, in a gravel system, but in a clay system, it is very, very slow. Not only this, so why was the range uh, present and also what are the differences in uh, the hydraulic conductivity let's look at a typical uh, case okay so uh, we have a heterogeneity in uh, the system and anisotropy in the system when i say system it is the soil or the rock matrix uh, rocks are heterogeneous and anisotropic same with soils uh, let's see what does that mean what what does you what do you mean by heterogeneity and anisotropy so let's take a soil sample. We're taking a soil sample at a particular location and the K, it could be permeability or hydraulic conductivity. Let's take hydraulic conductivity here. Uh, is Kx in the X direction and Kz in the Z direction? Uh, why am I not taking Y? Because X and Y are almost same. So this is how the plane is. This is your Z plane and this is your X plane. Your Y plane will go here. So your X and Y can be represented by two hands. I'm just showing you in a tilted fashion. So this is your Z plane and this is your X, Y plane. Okay, it is lateral uh, in direction. For those who want, I could just draw it uh, quickly so that you could see. Okay, so this is your uh, uh, X, Y plane, which is horizontal or lateral in groundwater flow. Uh, whereas your uh, Z is on the vertical, okay? So Z is very important for groundwater hydrology because gravity acts on it. X, Y is when uh, your gravity uh, pulls the water, but then more lateral movement happens due to slope and other reasons. Okay, so just to simplify, your X can be equal to K, Y. So uh, your X and Y could be the same um, uh, velocity or hydraulic conductivity or permeability. So we'll just take two planes. One is the Z plane and then the X, Y plane. Moving on, uh, let's take one example. Uh, one soil taken at KX, uh, X, Y location, and uh, that is uh, KX in the hydraulic conductivity X plane. And in the Z plane, it is KZ. In another location, location two, X1, Y1 is here, and X2, Y2 is here. You have KX and KZ, and at the two locations, the KX is the same as KX. Uh, KX1 is equal to KX2, same KZ1 is equal to KZ2. So which means the medium is homogeneous and isotropic, which means at the same location, um, the uh, uh, values are uh, same. And when you move to another location also, the values are same because Kx is equals to Kz. Okay, so in one location, the hydraulic conductivity is the same in X plane and your y, uh, Z plane, which is isotropic, same in the direction. And when you move to a different location, homogeneous, it is the same. Kx1 is equal to Kx2 and Kx1 uh, is also equal to Kz1 because of isotropy. Okay, so now moving to homogeneous and anisotropy. So here at one location, okay, let's say x1, y1, uh, you have Kx, which is uh, not equal to Kz. Okay, Kx is not equal to Kz, so it is anisotropic. So in different planes, the K value is different. So that is not concerning the isotropy, so it is anisotropic. But then when you go to a different location, your Kx are the same. Okay, Kx uh, in the location two is the same as location one. So Kx, Kx are the same, but same uh, Kz is also present. Kz2 is equal to Kz1. Okay, so both Kz uh, values are the same as Kx values. However, Kx is not equal to Kz, which means 
it is homogeneous so between locations it is the same but within the location within the location it is not the same so kx is not equal to kz within the location so it is an isotropy however if you take the same sample in a different location it is the same values in both the x and uh, y uh, direction or z direction so that is homogeneous now come to the next example. So these are case cases in the real world. Okay, so you can have a homogeneous isotropic. You can have a homogeneous anisotropic. Uh, and now we're going to heterogeneous isotropic, which means uh, in a particular location. Okay, the kx and kz are same. So in location one, kx is equals to kz. In location two, kx is equals to kz. However your kx1 is not equal to kx2. Okay. In different locations, the magnitude differs in your uh, values. However, the within the location, the values are same. So within the location, kx is equal to kz. However, in a different location, kx1 is, equal to, is not equal to kx2. So that is heterogeneity. But within the location, it is the same. So it is isotropic. Now we move to uh, the more uh, realistic version, the heterogeneous anisotropic. So which means within the location, your hydraulic conductivity is different in different planes. So Kx is not equal to Kz. So you have to have two measurements at least. And same when you go to another location, your Kx is not equal to Kz. Okay, so basically it is anisotropic. And moreover, the kx1, the measured value in kx at location 1, is not equal to kx2. So that is heterogeneous. So in a real world, uh, this is the most uh, abundant property. It is heterogeneous and anisotropic, which actually complicates the groundwater estimation. It complicates the um, uh, estimation of your hydrology. Uh, and that is why you need more and more data for groundwater flow. Anisotropic is de direction dependent property. So it is direction. It is, is it Kx or Kz? Uh, and how it differs is the uh, isotropic uh, and anisotropic properties. Uh, heterogeneity properties that varies from one point to another. So it is a spatial um, uh, property and it is a relevant scale. Okay, so you need to understand that one is at um, the directions uh, for the same location, how within the direction it changes and uh, homogeneous and heterogeneous are part of the, uh, the space, how spatially it differs. Moving on, uh, so as I said, therefore, there is a need to solve Darcy's equation law at different points. Uh, and take into account directionality. You cannot assume that Kx is equal to Kz uh, and also it is going to be the same as two locations. Uh, but how much can you do is dependent on your time and the cost to do these estimates. So uh, you need to balance your cost and time with the heterogeneity and anisotropic conditions. But in the real world, please understand that anisotropy and heterogeneity is much, much higher than homogeneous isotropy, uh, et cetera. So only the beach, maybe you could find homogeneous and isotropic conditions. Uh, but even then, um, are you going to study groundwater uh, in the beach locations? So you need to be very careful in where you are going to uh, do these applications and understand the soil and hydraulic connectivity values. Do they differ or not? Moving on, we are going to see uh, the uh, property that is more relevant, uh, more uh, important is the heterogeneous anisotropy. How do you solve it? So in, in the uh, Darcy equation, when we discussed last class, we saw Q is equals to minus K del H, which is the gradient, hydraulic gradient. And if the hydraulic gradient is one, your Q is, uh, equal to your hydraulic conduct ma magnitude. The direction is minus, okay? it goes the lowering direction. So let's write it in terms of uh, vector shorthand uh, to represent flow in one direction. So the flow in one direction is given as Qx 
is equals to minus k dh by dx. We're just expanding your uh, gradient. However, we saw in the previous slide that it is heterogeneous and anisotropic, which means from one location to the other location, the values can change. But within the location, it differs as per the plane x, y, and z. So in the normal, very, very uh, simplistic version, we say x and y are same. Okay. So, but however, there is difference in the z. So your x, y plane uh, you could take, but z is definitely different because z is gravity uh, and the process how water moves is different than the process how water moves uh, on the horizontal version. So then you have to expand in shorthand qx, qz. So q becomes qx. Now we are expanding it into two dimensions, uh, qx, qz. Uh, that is uh, equals to minus kx, x, kx, uh, z, k, z, x, k, z, z. And then you do the partial differential equations. Uh, it can be written in short form as qx is equal to minus qx, x, del h by del x, uh, minus k, x, z, dh by uh, dx, dz. So all these are partial differentiators, and you would know how to do this in the mathematical classes. But more importantly, um, uh, you can have another one for qz. Uh, and the similar equations can be written, uh, but do we stop here? No, because it is a three dimensional problem. Okay, so in a three dimensional world, uh, if you express it, it becomes a huge matrix, uh, and you know how to solve it is by using uh, matrix and differential equations. Hydraulic conductivity and permeability are tensors. So you would have to calculate uh, the component of KIG of these uh, uh, tensors. And that is a advanced groundwater hydrology class. <clears throat> so since uh, we are not going into the advanced level in this course, it is a perspective and introduction course on groundwater and groundwater uh, hydrology. Uh, I'm just going to introduce the uh, concept of what is the equation and how it varies uh, in the different planes, uh, but solving it won't be part of the class. If you think you're going to solve this by pen and paper, it's going to be really, really difficult and time consuming. Uh, and how many times can you do? Because you, if you want to study one hydrology groundwater equation per location, per time, it's okay but then you want to do it as a time series and you want to combine one location to the other and from there to the other. And so this cannot be done by hand. Uh, and that is why we do have groundwater models. The most uh, widely used model is Modflow, which is open source. Uh, we will be introducing the model uh, in the future lectures. So with this, I've covered most of the important hydrology components for the course. Um, let's do a quick recap so that we tie all the lectures from both week three and week four uh, to uh, a common understanding of what we did. So we introduced the hydrology components uh, in terms of groundwater. We studied how uh, water enters the system and goes into infiltration and uh, percolation into different compartments. We looked at the zone of aeration and zone of saturation. And then we differentiated the aquifers based on, is it uh, open in the surface to recharge as unconfined aquifers? And then if there is a uh, confining layer, we said uh, the aquifer within the confining layer to be a confined aquifer. We also noted that <coughs> the porosity is the most important factor to determine the groundwater storage and flow because that is the space which water occupies and water would uh, re reallocate itself uh, between the pores to move. Okay, so first infiltration gets the water inside and after that it starts to move through percolation. And if the uh, uh, pore spaces are connected, then more groundwater flow will occur. Porosity is a function of the soil or the rock material and we call it the matrix and how the soil particles are structured and in between how the pore space is there. We also noted that the pore space can have air, water, 
combination of both or none. Okay, so none is in the lab conditions, <clears throat> but most of the time it will be air and water. In a dry situation, it will be uh, only air, and in a wet, flooded situation, it will be only water. When it is dry, it is called dry soil, where only air is present in the pore space, and when it is full of water, we call it saturated soil. Here we call it zone of aeration, where air is there and water can come in by pushing the air out. Uh, and then zone of saturation is two, which is under the imaginary water table, where water occupies the pore space. Then once we established that, we wanted to see how the pore space can hold on to the water and what are the forces uh, and ind uh, indicators of uh, establishing this. So we looked at specific yield, wherein water enters a soil profile and gravity starts to act on it. So how much is the drainable porosity was given by specific yield? Why is this important? This is important because uh, a plant can know how much pressure to exert to take the water. A farmer can know how much uh, he or she has to put a pump to exert the water and how much gravity actually keeps pulling down the water. So in a gravel uh, field, you saw the specific yield to be very high, which means water would just flush through the gravel beds and not much water is going to remain. Specific retention is the opposite of specific yield, where it is a property of the soil to hold on to the water. And this holding on to the water actually benefits the plants in a, in a particular aspect if the specific retention is not too much. Okay, So because this is the property of holding the water in your soil. To visualize it, we took the sponge in the kitchen uh, washing dish uh, um, example. So you have a sponge and you squish it, all the water is out. It is a dry matrix. Now when you put water, and soak it in water and lift it up, the water will start to drip. And that is specific yield acting on the drowning of the uh, uh, water out of the sponge through gravity. And then what we did is when, after gravity has uh, uh, exerted its uh, force, then some water is still present in the uh, sponge, which is called the specific retention. The specific retention should not be too much like in clay. Uh, it, it Clay can hold on to water long, but that holding potential can also limit how much the plant can exert. Okay? The plant uh, can have uh, some water uh, that can be taken easily, but if it is too tightly bound to the soil like in clay, then the plant will not be able to grow. Then we looked at permeability and hydraulic conductivity. Permeability uh, was also a function of the material of how water is allowed to permit, permit to go through. Uh, and it is also a measure of your porosity and connected pores. How well is the pore connected? We looked at uh, effective porosity. And we looked at uh, water velocity as a function of these permeability and effective porosity. So because the pore space can be uh, at different uh, spaces, the big, big spaces, but if they're not connected, then the water won't flow. Water will just get stored and be there. And we wanted groundwater flow to occur, right? So from permeability, we uh, looked at another property, which is also a function of the fluid, uh, not only the soil, which is uh, a solid particle. We also looked at hydraulic conductivity, wherein the medium or the soil or the rock matrix uh, allows or conducts the water to flow as based on the properties of the fluid. Here the fluid is water, so we used the uh, viscosity and density of water to estimate hydraulic conductivity in soils. So hydraulic conductivity is both a function of the soil and the liquid that is passing through the solid. Uh, and for our rural applications and agricultural applications, we took water as a fluid. And based on that, we had different values for hydraulic conductivity of water in these different soil uh, parameters. We looked at hydraulic conductivity in a three-dimensional space, wherein uh, you have your Z, X, and Y. Uh, the X and Y could be almost um, equal uh, in uh, the velocities and the magnitude. However, Z can be different. 
we looked at anisotropy uh, and uh, uh, heterogeneity to be the major uh, factors of uh, making groundwater very complex. Just look at this in a surface hydrology perspective. In surface hydrology, you can quickly estimate is it going to be homogeneous or heterogeneous because the parameters are very less. The stream bed, you can look at, okay, water is going to flow in the river. Uh, it is almost the same uh, soil on the side, so you, it is okay. Uh, and is it isotropy? There's no, there's no uh, big, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, causes to stop the water other than like check dams and, and large dams. Whereas in groundwater, there are a lot of parameters that can uh, impede the flow, which can stop the flow. And the impede uh, is not the same at different points. It is heterogeneous and anisotropic. The, the basic properties that actually allow the water to flow is, is complex in nature. Uh, and we have looked at how it can be very, very complex. So the best way is to get a good fundamental understanding of these properties and the limitations or challenges in applying them in the real world. At one point, we also argued that we cannot afford both cost and time to take multiple samples uh, along every location. However, we need to estimate and assume some things. So most of the assumption would be at a range. Okay, so yes, we are agree that it is uh, heterogeneous. Uh, but it is within that range. And then we also said anisotropy, yes, and we have different values for kz and kx. However, we said between x and y, it's almost the same. So we said isotropic conditions for x and y. Homogeneous uh, was uh, dealt with very cautiously. So you need to understand the soil type in different locations to uh, estimate if it is homogeneous or heterogeneous. So in a groundwater model, you will actually dissect the differences in the layers uh, and say, is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? And the model will calculate it. We also looked at uh, solving these equations. Once we established the uh, variations in hydraulic conductivity, we said, okay, it's not as going to be a single one-dimensional problem or a two-dimensional problem. It is a three-dimensional problem. And we looked at the equations that will govern the three-dimensionality in Darcy's law. We also found that it is not easy to, uh, to solve the equation um, on pen and paper, maybe on one uh, equation, one location you can, but for groundwater you need to estimate what is the hydraulic conductivity here and the Q here, Darcy's Q, and then what is it here, what is it here to actually monitor the flow. And for that you need a connectivity and a feedback from each of the Qs uh, and that is mostly done by models. We also looked at water levels and hydraulic head, how to estimate the hydraulic head um, and water from water levels and groundwater depth. And from the hydraulic head and water levels, you jump into the Darcy's law. So with this, uh, we have uh, almost finished uh, most of the important components for groundwater hydrology. Uh, in the coming weeks, we will see how to use them. And also we will uh, go in deep um, uh, for particular aquifers, what are the parameters that are important? So we will re revisit some of these, uh, but the basic introductions have been done. I will see you in the next class. Thank you.